Uh, and now I'm really excited to, uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, Jeffrey Tucker is probably well known to many of you, if not personally, at least by, uh, by reputation. Uh, well known as, uh, as someone who uh, really worked at the Mises Institute and built that up. And as some of you may know, the Mises Institute can, in some cases, some of the people there can be a little bit of uh, polarizing or controversial figures. And I have yet to meet anyone who has anything but kind things to say about Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, we're really thrilled to have him. Uh, again, his, uh, his bio, he's now with Laissez Faire Books. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said something bad today on Facebook, but yeah, I won't right. go to that. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. I'll read that quote. Right. I'll, I'll date these comments from as of yesterday. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> it was completely up to date at that point. <laughs> After a long career at Mises, he's now with Laissez Faire Books and uh, and helping that organization do a lot to spread the ideas of uh, of liberty. And uh, and just to say a, a brief note, uh, Jeffrey Tucker is the kind of guy that someone like Jan Narvison, who's a very well known libertarian philosopher, shows up today and says, "Wow." How did you get Jeffrey Tucker? <laughs> and Jeffrey Tucker is the kind of guy who, when you email him, sends back with exclamation marks, I can do it. I'll be there. <laughs> we're fighting. So we're very happy to have him here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to his talk on liberation of humanity in digital spaces. And I do want to say a brief uh, thank you <laughs> to, uh, to our friend Roy Epen, who, uh, who kindly uh, sponsored uh, Jeff's flight out here. Yeah. Please take it away. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so flattered and really honored to be here. Um, you know, it's funny how it came to be that I accepted this gig. I'm a typical American, so meaning totally ignorant about geography. And I knew I was going to be in Vancouver last week. And I thought, well, I mean, that's in Canada. So it's like, you know. And then three hours later on the plane, I was asking the person next to me, how long is this flight anywhere? Where is this place called? This is insane. You know, so, yeah. There's something about the physical world that just annoys me in general. I, so that's why I'm going to be talking about the digital world uh, tonight. So are you ready to have some fun with ideas, right? Yeah. It's the most exciting space to live in. It's where we all live, and it's where our hope is, and it's why we have joyful, wonderful lives, because it's a world of immortality and infinity and without limits, and it's where we all dwell. And I'm so happy to know that there's a libertarian movement. I mean, it's a, so much more vast than it was when I was a kid, you know? I mean, there's like three of us or something. <laughs> and so it's very exciting to me. You know, how many of you have seen the movie Reds? OK, so the early scenes of the movie Reds, you know, it's featuring these socialists. And it's like, you know, 1903 or something like that. And they're all poets and playwrights and philosophers and dreamers of various sorts. And the movie opens up where they're living in a place that looks very much like this. <laughs> I mean, this is, they were out in the wilderness. They're all doing exactly what we're doing at this conference. This is what the socialists were doing, you know, about 110 years ago. So I had this vision when I walked up here because it looks exactly <laughs> like the scene in the Reds. And so I'm imagining you know, that in about 10 years, there's going to be some sort of, you know, uh, wild revolution in our favor, actually. I mean, if history <laughs> follows the, the same course of action. So I'd like to first start off with something slightly implausible. Um, during Steve Horowitz's smashing lecture, <laughs> it was wonderful. It was a wonderful talk, very intimidating, actually, to speak after something like that. He tried to recapture the word progressive, and I think he was very successful, don't you, in recapturing that word for ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have no problem in calling myself a progressive. In fact, I'm happy to say that. I usually call myself either a progressive or an anarchist, uh, depending <laughs> on how much I want to shock somebody, you know. Um, but so in this lecture, I'd like to recapture something even more ridiculous. I'd like to recapture the word socialist for ourselves. Oh. <laughs> no, no, we need to start thinking. In the first place, um, these socialists that were writing like 110 years ago, mostly what they wrote was good stuff. I mean, they were against war, right? They were against imperialism, mainly, as, as Steve pointed out. They were for prosperity, which strikes us all today as very strange, because our socialists that we know today are just sort of you know, they're all just sort of a big pain in the neck, right? I mean, all they do is tell us things we can't do. They're like the Puritan socialists, right? So, like, you know, we shouldn't be eating hamburgers or something, and, you know, McDonald's shouldn't be f using lard, and, 
you know, it's awful that you're driving around, you know, where you really should be riding a bike, <clears throat> and uh, you look at you flushing your toilet. I mean, this is terrible. You should be, you should be composting your toilet or something. And they, you know, I, I mean, the socialists have, be, uh, have completely changed. Um, they've turned against prosperity. They've turned against the well-being of humanity. They now think that we should all just um, kind of revert, you know, to a primitive state. Uh, this is a transformation that's happened within socialism, and, you know, you can ask yourself why. I think it began sometime in the, in the late 1960s with John Kelly Galbraith's book, um, which I can't remember the name of the book. Do you remember, Steve, something? Affluent yeah, Affluent Society. He's like, well, we're, we're just too rich. You know, what? How could that be? I mean, are we in favor of flourishing of humanity and everybody becoming more prosperous? That's what the socialists used to favor. I mean, think back on it. When the Bolshevik Revolution happened, First of all, it didn't happen because everybody wanted to be, you know, have nationalized property. Well, it happened because they didn't like the war. The war was drafting all the Russians into the army. They didn't like the inflation. The, uh, the, the currency was depreciating all the time. People were being robbed by the establishment and the elites. So the socialists were in favor of peace and um, the spreading of prosperity to all of humanity. That was the socialist ethos of the time. Look, I'm for all that stuff. So when I read the socialists, I totally accept their goals. Not their goals today, but back then their goals were pretty cool. I mean, I, it's great. The problem was they didn't really get the means right. They didn't get the, they didn't understand essentially economics. <clears throat> and Pete Becky posted the other day, he said, I've never known a socialist who um, understood a damn thing about scarcity. This is the core problem. The socialists, they don't get scarcity. You know, they don't understand that you need prices to allocate scarce resources. And the interesting, interesting question is, why is that true? I mean, why did the socialists not understand scarcity? I think we can return to, um, to Hayek in this case. You know, he wrote a really interesting essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism. How many of you read this, this? Yeah, so you know kind of more or less what he says. What he does is he disproves the idea that socialist ideology arose among the workers and peasants. So the workers and peasants weren't too into socialism because, um, well, they wanted stuff and they wanted to keep their stuff. I mean, they're workers and peasants, right? So, you know, they don't want anybody to take their stuff. Um, socialist ideology arose among the wealthy intellectual classes of the time um, who were not workers and peasants and Hayek goes to great lengths to show this and it was sort of a, a became a, this top-down ideology. The question is why did the elites ever glom onto this? And this is where Hayek doesn't really offer an explanation and I think I would like to attempt one. And it kind of goes like this. If you're an intellectual, or you're a playwright, or a poet, or a philosopher, or a cleric, or somebody who lives and dwells in the realm of ideas, and you're fairly well-to-do, then the world that you care about the most is not a world of scarcity at all. The world you care about is a world of non-scarce goods. It's the realm of ideas, which operates under completely different principles from that of physical reality. And what they imagined was that they would take this thing that they valued very highly, the non-scarce goods, the realm of ideas, and they would universalize it to create a kind of utopia. Now, is that so insane? Not really. In fact, it's entirely plausible. You can experience something like extreme abundance, superabundance, even something more spectacular in the realm of ideas. In the 19th century, there was a German um, sort of folk story um, about a land called Schadoffenland, right? That's, uh, which you might want to call Valhalla or heaven or there's a lots of different words. So it's a world of of, of, of infinite well-being, infinite prosperity for everybody. So in Schlafenland, it's very strange, it's sort of typically German, in the sense that um, it's very vivid and um, um, evocative. So in Schlafenland, for example, when it hails, it hails uh, sugar cubes, uh, which for some reason Germans imagine would be like a utopia. I don't, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, like, like, I'm not so interested in being held. It's 19th century, you know, Okay, well, there you go, right. So it's like, okay, so it's like hailing cocaine. Okay, so, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, and there's another funny moment in the, in the story where pigs walk the street, except they're already cooked, and they have, <laughs> and, and they have forks in them, so you can just kind of reach down and pull, pull up a piece of pork and eat it and put it in your mouth. That's, so, it's a land of, 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 of infinite bounty, you know. Um, so this is, this is essentially the world of ideas. Um, this realm of ideas is a fabulous place to live. Um, unfortunately, the physical world does not work like the realm of ideas, right? Um, so, for example, if I say anything compelling to you tonight, you can take it with you. And that's kind of great, right? So, um, and you can take it with you, and I'm not going to suddenly find myself tomorrow unable to think the same thoughts. <laughs> I mean, you haven't taken my thought from me, right? You've just, just, right. <laughs> But, for example, if you really like my bow tie tonight and you take that, I will find that I don't have it tomorrow, right? So, so thoughts can be sort of infinitely shared in a, in a beautiful way. Um, and intellectuals are enraptured by this. This is the early socialist imagined that the thing they cared about mostly, poetry and ideas and all these vivid things, which they imagined to be real, which because they are in fact real, um, as Mises himself says, <coughs> they imagined that there could be a whole world of plenty made out of these things. Um, other features of information, um, I think I'll wait on doing that. So that's why they weren't interested in scarcity, because they imagined a world of superabundance, and it was a beautiful thing. And this is what the socialists all believed. You know, when Lenin took over um, after the Bolshevik Revolution, do you remember what his slogan was for Russia? It was dictatorship of the proletariat and electrification of the country. That was the slogan. Electrification. Like, socialists are against electrification now, I think, pretty much. <laughs> you know? But back then, they weren't. They were for progress. They wanted, they wanted progress, and I think we should all favor progress. What they lacked was an understanding of the limits of physical space and the fact that you can't actually have infinite abundance in the realm of scarce goods. But they did get something very important, that you can have infinite abundance in the realm of non-scarce goods. So this realm of ideas is a beautiful and wonderful place to live. And I have to tell you how I came to live in that world myself. It was a really interesting moment. This was, I think, about 1996. So the internet had just, the World Wide Web had just become live, right? And so you could look at these billboards online. I mean, the first time I looked at the web, I thought, well, this is kind of stupid, you know, um, because it was just a, yeah, it was, it was just ridiculous. I mean, it was just, what? You know, so you can put like an ad, you know, one page ad online. It's like, why would anybody even browse by this? I can understand the billboard because you're driving down the highway, you can see it or whatever. But why would anybody want to turn on their computer, browse to this dub, dub, dub thing and stare at your billboard? And that's just dumb. So I couldn't make any sense of why this thing even existed. I mean, look, five years earlier, I couldn't understand email, you know. Uh, uh, somebody called me up and said, it was Tom Bethel, my friend uh, Tom Bethel, he said, um, Jeffrey, do you know this thing called email? And I said, no, I don't know, I don't know anything about it. He said, well, um, that's very interesting. You sort of send a message through your modem, <laughs> and it goes, uh, and, and it goes to somebody, except that somebody is not really necessarily there. Um, they can sort of wait. <laughs> They can wait like, like a day or two or longer. And then they dial up on their modem <laughs> and, and, and then they can read it. <laughs> and I said, well, well now I'm just trying to understand, trying to understand now. So instead of like, you know, just doing this immediately, you know, by hooking up our telephones, then like two or three days have to go by before they get the message? Why would you want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, you just call them up, tell them to hook up. And, you know, and then you get the message immediately, right? So I couldn't understand like what the point was. I said, well, is this free? He said, oh, no, it costs like $30 a month. I said, well, that's absurd. I'm never going to use such a... I mean, I'm never going to use that. That's just dumb. Uh, so it immediately... Which, by the way, is a lesson. You know, you, you think things are, are ridiculous, you know, and useless, and then enough time goes by, and it turns out it's the most spectacular thing that's ever been invented. So, and I'll get to Bitcoin in a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have to get reused to the implausible. We have to get to used to surprises. You have to. You can't always entrust your fir your first intuition on these things. So the web, World Wide Web, it's there on my computer, and um, uh, we had the owned at the time this domain called Mises Org, and um, 
and I learned how to sort of FTP into it and upload things, whatever. So I put an, uh, uh, I, I, I scanned a PDF at the time. I sort of sat over my scanner and scanned it and put a PDF and put it online. And I said, you know, what's, you know, that's whatever. And a couple of days went by, and I needed the book, and I was sitting in this chair here, except my bookshelf was like over there, three or four feet. <laughs> and the book I needed, I had just like odored up, you know, on my computer. And I thought, oh, well, I don't want to get on my chair, go over there. I'm just going to pull it up on my computer. And I pulled it up and looked at it. I thought, look at that. Look at my behavior. What am I doing? I wasn't even willing to get up at three feet to go over there to the shelf. I'm having to look at my computer. That's kind of crazy. I mean, maybe this whole web thing is just a big subsidy for laziness in some way, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> but then I realized something very interesting about that. I thought, well, what if I didn't own that book at all? I could still pull it up on my computer. Then it dawned on me, just like in a flash, anyone in the world can do what I just did. Anyone. And how many times can they do it? Infinitely, right. And they can download it to their machine. And I looked at my physical book, and I looked at that, and I realized that that's a scarce good, mm -hmm. and it can only be where it is. And if I want to get that scarce good to a guy in Beijing, I'd have to get on a boat and travel for several weeks and whatever. And then when he has it, somebody else can't have it. So the guy in Toronto can't have the book when as long as the guy in Beijing has it. If I'm holding it, nobody else can have it. But that thing on my computer, what have I done? I've made it possible for an infinite sharing of this one good. For how long? Forever. Because it can be reproduced and reproduced and reproduced trillions of times, and it never loses its value. So it's universal. And how much does it weigh? Nothing. It's weightless. So it's infinitely portable. And it can be simultaneously consumed by everybody forever. This thing is immortal. It's immortal. And I did it just by an electronic upload. And then the insanity began, <laughs> right? And it didn't stop. I couldn't stop putting everything online. Suddenly, this realm of digital media was the real world. I began to understand that I had migrated the greatest thoughts ever, th ever that anybody ever thought from the physical world, the realm of scarcity, to this realm of non-scarcity. I had transported a physical good out of time into eternity with one upload. And it turns out I wasn't the only one who was thinking this way. <laughs> Many people across the world were thinking this way. And thus began the great migration out of the scarce world of scarcity into the world of non-scarcity. And you have to learn to picture this world. You have to learn to imagine this realm of ideas. So to help you do this, let's just imagine what you're thinking right now. He's a genius. He's a <laughs> fraud. Uh, he's crazy. Hi, you know. Very dapper. Oh, the tie is impressive. Right, right. Lots of different thoughts. Now, OK, so you know, have you ever had a, like a CAT scan? Uh, where you go and you drink a potion, click, 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 and then they put you in a, like a thing, and then they can um, see the way your blood is flowing and where it's going, if there's anything active or whatever, so you can look at the x-ray and it's all colorized. Okay, so imagine I give you all a potion tonight, and you drink it, and guess what happens? Your thoughts become colorized. Hogtown. What is it? A hogtown hog beer. beer. Oh, hogtown beer. <laughs> and, and there are maybe other substances that can do something similar, I don't know. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> And you can look around at this room, and you look around at each other, and your thoughts are emanating from you, except they're all colorized in rainbow-like patterns. Yeah. And they're all sort of mixing with each other, and they're mutating and changing all the time. And you can look above all of our heads and observe this world, OK? This world really does exist, and it always has existed since, the time, since, since time began, really. The realm of ideas has always been a real place that you can observe and live in. And that's what intellectuals do. We live in this world of, of ideas, of colorized thoughts that are all around us, that are malleable, that are portable, that are weightless, that don't depreciate, that can't be killed by anybody, not governments even. <laughs> this is the realm of ideas. And it's the realm that the world began to migrate to in 1995. Now, here's what's interesting about this to me. Um, 
Humanity has only recently become fully aware of this sector of life, and it has something to do with the advent of digital media. Because if you think about it, it's always existed, right? I mean, it's not like the internet invented the realm of non-scarcity. Um, it just made it more tactile and made it uh, more present in our lives. But it's always existed. For example, um, when the Gutenberg Bible was invented, that was a big moment in history. Because before then, uh, the thoughts of, that were embedded in the world of writing had to be kind of um, always a, a labor-intensive job. So you had to have scribes. And like 20 scribes would take like three months to write out one Psalter. You know? and, and so um, the, the, it seemed as if when you held that Psalter, which is always the most valuable thing, it's more valuable than all the property that, it, that, it, that was on. I mean, I mean uh, you know, when, when monasteries were raided, they didn't care anything about the building. All they wanted was like the Psalter. You know, that's what, that was the main thing they would take. Um, but the ideas were attached to the physical property. With Gutenberg, we suddenly began to see the first glimpse of the possibility of separating the truly valuable good, namely the non-scarce ideas, from the physical property itself. Because you only had to set up the press one time, that's the labor, and then you could reproduce it and make copies. And that's kind of amazing. And that just dazzled the world, really. But if you think about the internet, all it is, one thing it is, and it's good enough, is it's a gigantic copying machine. You only have to do something one time, and then it can be consumed billions and trillions and trillions of times forever. So that's what makes it so spectacular. Again, the features of information. Information, it's weightless. Therefore, it's infinitely portable. If you can get into the space, it's good. Information is malleable. So once you receive it, you can repurpose it, and you can use it again however you want to. Information is sticky, so that it can be consumed anytime in the future. Anytime. It can't be killed by governments because it's invulnerable to extermination. That's the realm of ideas. This is Charlottenland. Information is reproducible unto infinity. So my consumption doesn't diminish your consumption of it. So if you look at all these features, you can see why it is, and it seems very obvious in retrospect, why it is that so much of life has migrated out of the physical world into this digital space. So it began with you know, emails and, and communications, and then you know, the World Wide Web came along and it became this gigantic, in 1995 everything was privatized and so everything could become these gigantic sp commercial spaces. And entrepreneurs got very busy and on the margin day by day, day by day, by day we'd share information with each other and we could communicate for the first time. And uh, we began to, get, began to put pictures up and then we began to put movies up. And then we began to put now even um, plans for, for printing objects. So even the physical world itself is migrating now to the digital space. And it's happening at an ever more rapid rate <clears throat> in an astonishing way. This year in 2013, two and a half billion indivi unique individuals will use the internet. That's an amazing thing. You think about it. What does it mean to be in communication with anybody, anytime, everywhere, um, at any moment of the day? If you look back at the history of economic growth, it's always been contingent upon human contact. You had to be in touch with people in order to learn from them. Robert Higgs has a wonderful book on the Gilded Age in which he demonstrates that a gigantic reason why the world became so prosperous in the second half of the 19th century is that people were moving to cities. And once you move into the cities, then you learn things. You find out things you didn't know before. You've had this happen to you before, right? You've traveled somewhere and discovered something completely new. Like I came here and found this amazing sauerkraut tonight. Right? I didn't know such a thing like that could ever exist. But you have, you, you have, right. I mean, so you have to travel to discover things. In the city, you're living in this swarm of ideas, just a, like a sandstorm of ideas. They're hitting you from every direction. And it causes you to be creative and think new th thoughts you never thought before. And it's not just that you take somebody's ideas and they take yours. No, it's because you're together, you together come up with something that a part you might never have known. You've ever had a conversation like this? It's a great thing, where you're both slightly stupid before it began, and then together you discover something amazing, and then you take away from it more than either of you brought into it. That's a beautiful thing about the malleability of ideas. You create a new good that otherwise wouldn't have existed, and it's all contingent upon that human contact. But do you see what's happened with the internet now? We've all moved to the city. Everybody in the world, almost, 
has moved to the city in the way they did in the Gilded Age, except you stayed right where you are. Isn't that amazing? We've overcome geography. Our capacity to learn from each other is no longer contingent upon physical space. This is a miracle. This is an astonishing thing. We've moved to utopia. Two point two and a half billion uh, unique individuals view the internet this year. Every hour, enough information is com consumed by internet traffic to fill seven million DVDs. The total amount of information on the web is. Does anybody know how much information is on the Twelve web? Uh, <laughs> no. What? How much? Twelve terabytes. Well, I think that was last month. Um, <laughs> that's now estimated to be one yottabyte. Yeah, it's true. Does anybody know what a yottabyte is? <laughs> so, a yottabyte is 1,024 zettabytes, with one of which is 1,024 exabytes, one of which is 1,024 petabytes, one of which is 1,024 terabytes. Oh, there we go. Now you're starting to recognize terms, you know? Yeah. One of which is 1,024. And then we go back to better <laughs> ways, right? Back to megabytes, right. In other words, it's impossible to imagine, right? Um, back in the, in the day, when I first started putting Mises Org online, right, um, there were some, uh, you know, in, in Romania, which they had very limited internet access. I knew about people, because people would <laughs> get up to our servers and just tie it up. I mean, the, back before we moved to the cloud entirely, where everything was really physical, our servers were grinding away and hot all the time. And I'd have these guys from Romania, like, <laughs> Get onto the server and they'd burn, burn, burn. You know every bit of content off the, off the and this, yeah, and this, this is what they did. All, you know the way. So you know how long it would take you to, to uh, burn the entire internet now uh, to to your hard drive if you had a, such a thing. If you started like right now on your home computer, eleven trilling years. <laughs> That's a lot of porn. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. But probably, let's be fair. Yeah, well, so you know, the value of it is, is another question, right? Um, and I'm just going to make a passing comment here about um, since since I've I've hopefully helped you imagine why it is that everything is. Is, is migrating out of the physical world, which has its limits. Right? Now, let me be clear about the difference between scarce and non-scarce. I don't mean just whether there's a lot of something or a little of something. Like, for example, that wonderful beer we're drinking tonight is like super abundant, but it's still scarce, right? <laughs> so if I drink this beer, then you can't have it. By, 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 by scarce, what I really mean is that there's a, there can be a dispute over the thing itself. If it's not scarce, it means that there's no reason for there to be a contest over it. We can have simultaneous consumption of the same good. That's what non-scarce means in an economic sense and what scarce means in an economic sense. So I think we need to start taking this realm of non-scarcity very seriously. And when you begin to look at the advantages of this migration, you see why it's happened. This dream of the old socialists, in other words, that they, that they imagined, a world of superabundance, is in fact coming true, not in the way that they imagined but solely because we're doing this great migration, because of the invention of the internet, the greatest tool for liberty ever imagined. And look what's happened to us since the invention of the internet, since the privatization of the web. Our ideas have gotten out there for the first time. It's also a consequence of hard work of groups like Students for Liberty and many other groups out there, but it's also because for the first time we now have the capacity to, to reach um, all of humanity. And this is where all the great creativity of our time is taking place, in the realm of the internet, which is an astonishingly huge thing. Keep an eye out on um, 3D printing, for example. Do you, do you understand what it means for, for me to be able to dope out a quick CAD file of any physical good and be able to trans transport it to anywhere in the world, right? I mean, it makes it impossible for governments to regulate any physical things anymore. I mean, it's just, it's, it, um, if, if I don't like the way and by the way, you know, in the Western world, we have detailed central plans for like practically every physical good. You wouldn't believe it. If you doubt this, um, just, just look through the Federal Register 
and um, find any physical good you can possibly think of and look it up. I wondered why my lawnmower wasn't working a few months ago. And, <clears throat> and I thought, well, you know, it's because it is not able to suck air. What's wrong with this design of this thing? It's kind of crappy. Surely private enterprise didn't do this to me. I looked it up. And yeah, it turns out the US government has like a, a specific central plan for lawnmowers, how they have to be built, you know, how low they have to be to the ground, everything. All, it's all in the name of saving me, right, for myself, uh, <laughs> inevitably, right? But look, in the future, I won't have to worry about that. I won't have to worry about crazy government regulations because all I have to do is download uh, a physical object of my preference and uh, send it off to a 3D printing company, which may be local, maybe it's in my basement. And I can make, make that, that physical world happen. So you see the way it's working, right? Governments destroyed the physical world in many, many ways. We migrate to the, to the, to the cloud, and then the cloud comes back down again and reinvents our reality for us. How about that for private enterprise? Isn't that fabulous? It's amazing. It's an amazing world we're entering into. Now, think about government for a second. Everything government is doing and does is very much bound up with physical space. If it can't control physical space, it can't control anything because it can't control ideas. It can't control ideas any more than can control something like algebra. Like, let's say if, if uh, uh, Obama decided he didn't like algebra and abolished it, right? What are we going to do? We're all going to laugh. It's absurd. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, oh, OK, yeah. Can't do algebra, huh? Mm -hmm. And you start doing it in your head immediately, right? <laughs> the world of Breaking Bad, this world of ideas, it's all Breaking Bad. You know, we can think whatever we damn well want to, you know? We can, and that's the, the, it's the internet, and there's no way they can stop it. Uh, government control is very much tied up with physical property. And look at their organization charts, the way they're working, right? I mean, you can download an organization chart of the, of the federal government. It's like, okay, here's the president, here's the Congress, the Supreme Court, here's the, here's the agencies, whatever, and it all breaks down in a very clean way. How do you compare that to the organization of the internet, the realm of ideas, the, the world of non-scarce ideas? I mean, the, the picture of the internet is just these infinite nodes spreading out in, a, in, a, in, a, in trillions of different directions. I, you could just imagine beginning on top of a large building and hurling off the top of the building you know, um, thousands of paint cans, and they fall all the way down to the, to the bottom and then just splatter all over the street. That's what you know, a tiny little piece of the internet looks like, actually, if you're able to colorize it and look at it. It's just spectacular. It's all built by human choice and human action. This is something that the government can't control. If you doubt what I'm saying, I know you're all thinking NSA, NSA, look. Um, I recommend that everybody do this. And only because I'm here am I able to say this. I was speaking at uh, the Agora Financial Symposium last week. I would never have dared to bring this up in front of that, that audience, but I will bring it up in front of you. I recommend that you go to a little town called the Silk Road. <laughs> because this one little space, this little digital space, refutes the whole idea of government itself. It cannot control our world. This is the place that makes narcotics seem very mundane, actually. I was expecting to go and be shocked, right? So you have to get there through the Tor browser. They only accept Bitcoin. But you go there, and you know, like headline, you know, there's 300 different grades of marijuana that you can get. Uh, there, are, um, you know, you can buy uh, heroin, you can buy cocaine, you can buy um, uh, ecstasy, you can buy, you know, uh, ecstasy cut by half if you don't want to be so full of ecstasy. You just want to be sort of half <laughs> ecstasy. You can get that thing. You can buy all this. You can buy many other things. You can buy pill makers. You can buy beakers. You can buy anything you want. Now, you might be scandalized by it. Actually, what's interesting, if you go to it, it's just like eBay. You know, it's just eBay. And there's, there's, there's suppliers and there's customers. They rate everything. Oh, well, that was pretty good, you know. Um, I liked it. It was pretty, pretty nice. You know, it didn't, wasn't exactly what I expected. And then the, the guy who sent it said, well, yeah, that wasn't such a good batch. I'll do better next time. I'll give you your money back, you know. I mean, it's just sort of normal commercial talk. Now, this, by any standards, this place isn't supposed to exist, right? Why does it exist? How does it exist? We've got every government in the world in, in a, now a 40-year war on drugs. And yet, anyone in this room can actually browse to a digital space with a couple of clicks and, and, and buy some narcotics to be delivered right here on Monday? <laughs> That's how powerful governments are. I mean, unbelievable, right? I mean, it's crazy. They think they are not running the world. Uh, you know, as libertarians, I think what we sometimes get overly intimidated by governments. You know, I mean, we're going about our lives, then we discover liberty, and we think, oh, for God's sake, there's this horrible Leviathan state that's running everything. That's really depressing. And then we sort of mope around for a few years, you know, tell with the government, look at all the terrible things they're doing. You know, I'm, 
you know, this is why I suggest you go to Silk Road. The government actually does not have the amount of power that libertarians themselves tend to attribute to it, actually. Yeah. It's not nearly as powerful as they think. Yeah. Most of life is organized by human action by our own choices. It's why we are here in this, under this tent by our own. Nobody forced us to come here. We all came because we expected to get out of it more than we put into it. And so it is for all of human population. Stand on top of a big building in Sao Paulo and look out. Could government have created that? Absolutely not. Could government have made Boston? Of course not. The government can't do anything hardly at all. It's just a big menace and it's just a big parasite. That's pretty much a good description of government. It's a murderer, it's a cheater, it's a stealer, but it doesn't do a damn thing otherwise. It doesn't organize anything. We are the organizers of life, all of us in, our, in this room. We're the real power on this planet. I got carried away with that remark. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure you did. Okay. I've spoken too, too long. And You'll know when I'm about to be done because I'll say the word rant. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk just a little bit more about digital space because I don't think that we are capable of imagining what this future might look like. Um, I don't think, as imaginative as you think you are, I don't believe that you have thought it through. I certainly haven't because every day I'm being surprised by the astonishing things can, that can happen. So let me just quickly talk about money. It has been nationalized by government for a hundred years, at least. And that's a terrible thing, because, as the cliche goes, it's half of every transaction. And governments own that. And it's terrible. And look what they've done to it. They've destroyed it. They've made it kind of shitty. Um, you know, they keep reducing its value. Uh, go government money, uh, uh, because of government money, they can produce an infinite amount of it, hand it out to their friends. It's business cycles and bailouts and, and, and upheavals all over the world. I mean, paper money that government has owns has been the, the, a, a catastrophic thing, not only in this century, but all times. So is it possible that we could have a money that could actually live in the internet? And this has been tried now for about 20 years. Um, how can we create a kind of digital currency? Um, but guess why it kept failing? You know why di crypto or, uh, digital currency kept failing again and again? I mean, it failed for like 15 times. You need a trusted ledger. You need a trusted ledger. That's one way to put it. Centralization is another thing. Yeah. But I don't think that's the core Scarcity. of it. Scarcity. Yeah. Who said that? Me. Okay. Right. So here's the problem. Right? So in the digital spaces we talked about, we have infinite reproducibility. It turns out in the realm of money, that's a very bad idea. <laughs> I mean, that's what, we are, that's what we have, right? We have that shit. It's no good. Um, so we need something that is not going to be able to be spent twice. Um, that can't be double spent, that you can really keep up with. That has strict ownership titles attached to it. So every unit of that currency has a distinct owner. And this is what Satoshi Nakamoto did in 2008. He solved the problem. Actually, there was one service that predated that. It was, I think it was Eagle to solve the double spending problem before Satoshi did. But it had the problem that it was owned by a single corporation. So you have a trust issue, right? So what Satoshi did is he distributed his, um, well, first of all, he figured out how to prevent the double, double spending problem by creating this great blockchain in the sky. It's a ledger. It's a ledger-based money. So every incremental unit of the currency has a distinct owner attached to it. Not a, not a physical person, but, but an identity. And, and this, this, this ledger is like almost puritanical in its assignment of property rights. I mean, if you own it, I can't own it. It's just like physical space. And that's hilarious. I mean, look what he did. He recreated the physical world in the, in the cloud. You know, by use of the blockchain. This is brilliant, brilliant programming. So every unit of the good has a distinct owner. And if I own it, then you can't own it. If I transfer it to, uh, to you, then I can't own it anymore. So we've got a kind of property relationship. Now, how do you trust it? What he did is he um, made it possible for the blockchain, this great ledger in the sky, to exist on distributed networks all over the world. So whatever node that, that, that it happens to be, it can be a host of this blockchain. So it's entirely open source just like WordPress or any other great open source program. So anybody can look at it. In other words, there's no reason, no need to audit Bitcoin the way everybody's clamoring for the Fed to be audited. Please audit the Fed. We want to know what's going on. We want to know what's going on inside that building. OK. You don't have to audit Bitcoin because you always know everything that's going on at all, all times. Anybody can pull up the, the blockchain and look at it. 
And it's distributed and, and exchanged peer to peer, just you to me. So I don't need a third party involved in exchanging this. So I can exchange physical property with you and um, without having to go through any third party agency. Now, look, at, why is this an advantage over our current system? Our current system is this. We have a rotten government that uh, prints up paper tickets, except it's not, it doesn't really print a lot of it. It mostly exists in the digital space. And how do we spend it? We spend it through credit cards. But what the hell is this? I mean, when we spend a credit card, what are we coughing up? Are we coughing up property? Not really. We're giving up our identity. We have to trans transmit our trust relationships. Now, you have to give credit to the free market for having hacked this 1950s crappy old credit card system enough so that it actually works in an internet age. But in an internet age where you can have infinite global commerce, we surely need some kind of some kind of money that makes it possible for us to transact with each other real property rather than having to cough up our identities like we have to do all the time. Like um, iTunes right now owns 250 million u unique individual identities. That's a little bit dangerous, isn't it? And you know what? There's 17 million identity thefts in the United States every year. And, and that's because we have to cough up who we are every time we spend our money. This is, this is a bad system. Not to mention the fact that it excludes a third of humanity just because they have bad neighbors. So if you live in Nigeria, you can't exchange with anybody. You can't get a credit card. You're essentially unbanked. You're financially excluded from the world economy. That's not the way it should work. The free market wants to involve the whole globe in, in a great project of exchange and creativity, except that our credit card system isn't allowing it. It's very bad. Now, this is mostly because of anti-fraud measures. It's very difficult to... Uh, to manage this system. But ideally what you would have is a system where I could exchange anything with a person with Kenya, real property, without having to give up my name and address and uh, social security number, my medical records, and have a trusting relationship with a third party provider that's going to hold on to my information for the next 100,000 years, right? That's a bad deal. So Bitcoin overcomes this problem too, which is why it's extremely popular in Africa. All unbanked parts of the world are very interested in it. And it's extremely popular in places where there's currency upheaval. For example, in Cyprus, there was a great currency upheaval uh, just a few months ago. And uh, the government said, you know what? We're not going to let you have your deposits to all the Russian depositors. And many people had already linked their bank accounts to Bitcoin and said, that's not a problem at all with us. And then immediately transferred all their property out of their banks into Bitcoin and put it into the cloud until it was safe. And then they downloaded it back into another bank. How fabulous is that? That's just amazing. So right now, Bitcoin serves as a kind of payment system combined with currency. Uh, Steve Horwitz was earlier asking about the regression theorem problem. How does this thing have value in the first place? Well, when he released it in January 2009 in response to the great uh, crisis of 2008, it, it had a value of exactly zero. And by October, it had a value of uh, 0.02. So like uh, a, tenth of a, a tenth of a penny, all right? So that was its first registered value. It took 10 months. And then after about um, another 18 months or so, in February 2011, for the first time, Bitcoin achieved dollar parity. Um, plausible to believe. It's just incredible that it ever happened. And most of the early miners of Bitcoin actually um, sold because they thought it'll never go any higher than that, right? <laughs> I mean, we're looking at Bitcoin at, at $100, you know, a Bitcoin today. So it's defied every expectation. One quick note about mining. So this guy Satoshi is some sort of genius because the problem was you can't just sort of dump a bunch of money on the world all at once, right? You have to have it sort of come out gradually and you want there to be real work involved in digging it up just like it was in the 19th century. So just like the gold standard, right? So when the gold st the, in the, under the gold standard people would move to California and start to mine gold and at first you could dig it out of a river uh, because it was just flowing by, and you put it in a pan, it's like, there's your gold. But then all the gold's out of the river, you have to start digging into mountains. And you have to use more and more deeper and more and more expensive equipment to get the stuff. And it's only worth it to do, to do that if the price of gold is high enough to justify that, right? It's a fairly ingenious system the free market created for, uh, for, dis for gradually releasing gold into the economy so there's not too much inflation. It keeps over productivity. You create a kind of a perfect monetary system. The problem with gold, of course, is that it's physical. So you have to have proximity in order to trade with it. In the digital age, to hell with physical world. We want to trade with anybody, anytime. So he invented a system of mining for, um, for Bitcoin. So your computer has to work to solve difficult algorithms. At first, they're rather easy. 
and the first Bitcoins that were mined that come to you, you know, it wasn't a problem. But the more CPU power that gets involved in the mining actions, the, the more the algorithm itself becomes more and more difficult. So it's calibrated to create only 25 uh, new Bitcoins every 10 minutes. And they're, they're released into a blockchain. They're verified by all the miners. Uh, uh, who are rewarded for their hard work of verifying transactions by themselves obtaining Bitcoin through their mining activities. And one of the coolest things that's happened just in the last six months, because it's so exciting, I have to tell you about it, um, there's a huge industry of Bitcoin mining equipment that's emerged now, and it's really fun. At first, there were little ASICs miners that are these little uh, things that you stick into, um, into your computer, and it'll mine Bitcoins for you. And then once the ASICs became boring and you know, not so great, and there are more and more CPO power uh, involved in it. Now there's butterfly miners you can buy that are big boxes. They cut about, cost about $3,000. It's a six month wait to get them. And then you plug that in and it's like a serious miner and it's just like mining all the time. So you see the way the market is working. By the way, the ASICs mining company itself went public, um, but only in the Bitcoin uh, uh, cloud. So you can buy stocks and uh, distribute dividends entirely in Bitcoin. Right? So that's, uh, that's our future. If you want to imagine a future of the world financial economy being reinvented by the free market, that's the way it's going to happen in the blockchain. So the most implausible system you can imagine. Now, I myself was not a believer until this past, past February where I, where I began to own some, and now I use it all the time. I can use it at Walmart. I can use it at Target. I can do anything else. Now, how am I going to do that? Right? How's this going to work? Because they don't have a big sign that says we accept Bitcoin. Well, what happened is Free Enterprise to the Rescue, once again, a wonderful company that was already doing very well distributing gift cards online. It's called GIFT, G-Y-F-T. You can go to it and buy a gift card. Uh, they integrated themselves with one of my favorite companies in the Bitcoin space called BitPal, my friends in Atlanta. I love to hang out at their offices, right? And uh, talk to them about stuff. They made a deal with, with GIFT. So now GIFT accept, uh, accepts Bitcoin. So when I go to Walmart and they tell me that my toaster costs $43.12, all I have to do is, with one click, buy uh, a gift card for that exact amount with Bitcoin, hand them my smartphone, they scan it, and I'm done. I've totally bypassed the government dollar system. You see how this works? Spectacular. And when people say, yeah, but, I just want to say, hold on, give it a few months, all right? The market develops. It's always evolving, and it's always surprising us in the most spectacular ways. This is what's happening in our digital space, and I've talked too long. So let me finish up. And I'm going to read something I wrote the other day, just because I'm afraid I'm not going to say the right thing. And I do too much of this improvising anyway. The point is this. The digital world unleashed this realm of non-scarcity that we want to migrate to. The whole globe is migrating to it. And it's causing astonishing levels of productivity, precisely because of these attributes of immortality, of universal sharing, of infinite portability, it's bringing the world together in a division of labor. It's creating this utopia that the socialists imagined. And they were right. It does exist in the realm of ideas. What's cool is that now the physical world is gradually, step by step, migrating to that very world that they imagined. And you are all involved in this process. We are working towards that ideal. That's why I think it might not be a bad idea for us to change our name entirely to socialists and be done with it. <laughs> I don't think the political implications of all of this has begun to dawn on anybody yet. We still, still keep pretending as if governments are in charge, but they are not. They loot, they menace, they regulate, they posture, they preen, they hector, but they, they do not finally control. It is not possible. Even the strictest regulations that exist in places like China are a national joke. So I don't even think we need to be worrying about the NSA at this point. So people ask about my optimism. Let me just state it as follows. The state, in all times and all places, wants a population of despairing, dreary, hopeless, weighted down people. Why? Because such people don't do anything. They're predictable, categorizable, pliable, and essentially powerless. Such people offer no surprises, threaten no change, and destabilize nothing. This is the ideal world that the bureaucrats, the pure plutocrats, and the technocrats want. It makes their life easy and their path clear. Today is just like yesterday and tomorrow forever. This is the machine that the state wants to manage a world of 
down in the dump people and obedient citizens of the society that they think they own. That is not us. We libertarians are a people of hope and hope always upsets the prevailing order. It sees things that don't yet exist. It acts on the promise of a future different from today. It plays with the uncertainty of the future and dares to imagine that ideals can become a reality. And those who think this way are a threat to every regime in all times and all places. And why? Because people who think this way eventually come to act this way. We resist, we rebel, and we overthrow. And you look around, we see progress everywhere. And what does it imply? It implies that non-compliance is the human norm. People cannot forever be pressed into a mold of the state's making. The future will happen, and it will be shaped by those who dare to break bad, dare to disagree, and dare to take the risk to overthrow what is in favor of what can be. I realized this some years ago, and then when you begin to look around and see how the power elites do not and cannot rule, you discover the whole secret to the social order. It turns out that they are not really in control, not finally. Then it all becomes lots of fun. It's a blast to see the powerful toppled from the thrones they want to sit in so badly. It's a thrill to use and hold technologies that no one among the elite ever gave permission to exist. It's a kick to see how the market, meaning human beings acting with vision towards the future, is so constantly outwitting the arrogant planners who want to freeze history and control our minds and wreck our world. To defy them is so simple. Just imagine a future that is better than the present, and you become an enemy of the state, and you begin to love every minute of it. You become part of the solution and see that your life and energies are worthwhile and making a difference. And how fortunate we are all to be living in these times. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead. Can I, can I take some questions? Is it okay? Yeah, I got yeah. the mic. So. Yeah. Yeah, of course you got a question about Bitcoin. Bitcoin's cool. <laughs> so, my, like, I, I see the main value in Bitcoins avoiding the fact like, like it's, it's outside of government control. Right. That's the primary value. Yeah, I'm sure you already know what I'm going to ask. Feel free you to answer. Can government control it? They can. Well, more, where, where does the value, assuming we could get rid of government currency, wh will it continue? Like, how do you see that? No, I'm not sure I understand your question. Assuming we get rid of government currency, what is the value? Right. Okay, the value is that um, the value is that Bitcoin restores money as property, as it should be, right? I mean, when money was invented, it was just property. Look, when you go to a commercial establishment and you throw a dollar down and you buy a beer, you just exchange property, right? I mean, that was your dollar, and you get a beer, and you're happy, and he gets your dollar. And you know he's happy, and everybody walks away happy, and that's great, right? Mm -hmm. You've just exchanged property. You haven't exchanged identity. You haven't had to have a trusting relationship or anything like that. So in a perfect world, we would reproduce that exchange relationship you just had on a global scale, so that any two people, geographically non-contingent, can have that same exchange relationship. That's what we would dream about if we could. Right. But we haven't been able to do that up to now because uh, it hasn't been technologically possible. Okay. So what Bitcoin does is it restores the idea of money as really existing property and makes it possible for us to ex exchange these real pieces of property with title, uh, you know, regardless of geography, so that I can live, so I can be at the bar, you know, spending a dollar on a beer um, with somebody in Iceland right now, or somebody in Brisbane, Australia, or whatever for any good, I don't have to know who they are, I don't have to know anything about them, we don't have to have a third party involved with any kind of trust relationship at all, at all. We just exchange real property. That's what technology has made possible, and that's why Bitcoin is, is working, and that's why it's so much su more superior to any government system. Okay, I, 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 thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I get a little 
a little nutty when I talk about the subject I know. So I, if I'm saying something you don't understand, just uh, there was a, a meme today online that said 10 things that people don't, don't understand but pretend they do. Number two was Bitcoin. So yeah, yeah. I, uh, the ideas you, the ideas you pre uh, presented uh, about the digital world, I understand, okay? But somehow, I fail to see you did not include any of the uh, real creators of wealth, like the producers who do make the buildings, the guys who do manually make the machinery to mine the Go into the mines, okay? They're not mentioned in, in your speech whatsoever. Well, the fact is that, uh, yeah, I understand that. And, and that's, uh, but the question is, why, why is it that I'm not talking about um, the, the heroic producers of wealth in the physical world? And the, the answer to that is, is simply that it wasn't the main subject of my speech. I mean, be, uh, and also the, the overwhelming majority of the world's um, economic growth, I think, is largely attributable, attributable to technology and, and, and digital migration over the last 20 years, which has actually Im vastly improved the function of the physical world as well. So digits have if, you know, brought vast efficiency gains to the physical world, too. Uh, and then the second thing about money. Uh, money was not created by the government. Money was created for exchange of goods. A shoemaker would make his shoes, and uh, if he wanted groceries or something else, what would he do? Make a pair of shoes for the grocer? No, that would not work, okay? So he got for his labor, somebody bought the shoes, and right. they got an exchange of money that was right. then used for an exchange for him to buy the things he needed. Right, so he's making a very uh, profound and important point that gov government didn't originate, uh, that money didn't originate with governments, it was originated through private exchange. And that's precisely what, uh, well, that was the core of my point. I mean that uh, what we ideally have is a money that is created within, um, by, by markets alone. You know, here's the thing about the, something like an agenda like the gold standard and these other monetary reform things. I'm all for fixing up the dollar. I'm all for you know, a gold standard or any kind of uh, constraints you can put on, on, on money or any kind of money reforms. Um, that's great. The problem is you always have to persuade politicians to do these things. And it turns out they're not too, so uh, excited about doing them. right? <laughs> so, and the banks aren't so excited about doing it either. So if we're going to have a monetary reform, ideally what would happen is it would reform itself, which is one of the themes I'd like to... I want, uh, wanted to explore tonight is the capacity of private markets to reinvent the world, you know, and not, I mean, uh, libertarians are, s are funny. I mean, one of the reasons we get depressed is that, first of all, we get overwhelmed at the size of the state, you know, and it's so gigantic and horrible, and then we think, well, I know what, I know what let's do. Let's kind of get together and urge the state to give us more rights and freedom. <laughs> and it's not so easy, it turns out. Um, it doesn't work so well. I mean, governments are not sort of really inclined to want to do this. And, and after, you know, you become politically active and you expend three or four years of your life at this, it's very possible that you'll kind of end up in this despairing state. And I've known many libertarians that are like this. You know, they get sort of depressed over time. And I think it's just because we haven't been imaginative enough. You know, it's like we're all standing in front of this big mountain called government, and it's like in the way. And we want to it to go away. So we just start screaming at it. Go away, mountain. Go away. And then it doesn't happen, and we keep screaming louder, and then it, this goes on for you know, months or years, whatever, and eventually we get bored of doing that, so we start screaming at each other and divide into factions, and you know, then that's the, that's the rest of history. So, um, so a much better way to do this, actually, is to figure out ways around the mountain, maybe uh, underneath the mountain, you know? Um, figure out creative ways to get around it so we can move on with, with history. And, and this is essentially what private markets are doing right now, especially in the internet has assisted us very much in this regard. But I would say this is pretty, pretty much the history of liberty. You know, it's always been about reinventing the world in creative and imaginative ways and discovering new ways to go about having a flourishing life. You know that all progress that's ever existed in the world is due to, to human action and human choice and, and private property and, and markets and commerce. I mean, governments haven't done a damn thing, really. Um, so anytime you see history, you know that the markets are working. They're finding ways around the elites. I mean, governments always, in all times and all, all places, and Mises talks about this in one of his books, you know, they, 
They just want they just want to take and they want to control and they want to freeze. They want to freeze history. They want to take our stuff and uh, make everything sort of static so they can live off of us and that's it. But they, they haven't succeeded because we keep seeing progress. So what does that progress do to? Progress is due to things like private enterprise and the, you know the magical world of, of commerce like we saw in that I pencil movie, which is such a beautiful movie. That's that's where our energy should be put. That's where we need to put our hope and our faith. Not so much in begging the government to reform, to figure out how we can use our lives and our minds and our creativity to enliven this world of freedom and make the world a better place for ourselves first, and then for others uh, second, and then for future generations later. And it's possible. We just have to be creative, not get depressed, but um, be hopeful, like entrepreneurs. Every one of us should be an entrepreneur. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, who else? Right Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Good evening. Um, suppose you write a book in order to sell it to make a profit. Okay. Or suppose you, um, you shoot a movie in order to make a profit. Or suppose you own a patent or so on. Right. And I buy it. And I decide to upload it on internet. And then <laughs> you won't make a profit anymore. Right. So my question is, is do you care about private property on intellectual property? Uh, there is no private property in the world of ideas. So That's how I would answer that. So uh, you don't like it? Uh, no, intellectual and, property. And, and that will appall you and outrage you. And, um, and um, unfortunately, it would take me a very long time to kind of march through all the arguments. But no, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea for government to enter, to this, into this, enter into this realm of ideas and start slicing and dicing things and pretending as if they can assign property um, to this world. Because it, it actually disables the very uh, beautiful thing about, about ideas, which is that we learn from each other. The whole history of commerce has been improvements on the margin. We look around and learn from, from what other people have done and try to improve on them. And patents just end up slowing down the process. They haven't played that big a role at all in the history of development. I mean, empirically, you can actually see this demonstrated again and again. Um, and actually, what they do do is end up slowing things down so that one monopolist can preserve a kind of a profitable position for a greater length of time. And actually, these days, very, very few of the products that uh, we consider to be uh, really important in our lives are, 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 are patented. It's, it's, it, it's not that big a deal, and it's actually causing a, a terrible train wreck in the software industry. And if every software company could, could, could right now get rid of them, they probably would. The problem is that you have to pretty much play the game in order not to be looted by somebody else who is playing the game. So it's a kind of a, a problem. In the world of copyright, I would strongly suggest, insofar as is possible, that you put everything into uh, something like a Creative Commons relationship. Um, I mean, when I came on to laissez-faire, um, it was a kind of an issue because I was going to work for a conventional publisher, and I knew they would do things the conventional way, and I made, it, made my hiring contingent upon the publishing of everything into the commons. And they were very reluctant. They didn't really know what the hell I was talking about, but they agreed to it. So everything laissez-faire books is published into the commons. And the reason I do that is the same reason Leonard Reed uh, published the Freeman into the Commons back in the 1950s and the 60s. Is that you want the ideas shared? That serves as a s form of advertising. You don't want them behind uh, protected uh, walls that the state uh, erects. Yeah. So, so I, I, that may shock you. I'm I'm sorry yes, to I'm appall you with my, my my comments. By the way, uh, trademark is ridiculously ineffective. I was just in in Rome, and it's a wonderful world of you know like you know fake goods you know like everywhere, and you know it just thrilled me to no end. Everybody knows you know, what is a counterfeit and what is not a counterfeit. But that's a really a totally different discussion. So I'll just, I'm just going to alarm you and then move on to the next question. Yeah. So what about R&D, though, for a pharmaceutical company? Like, how would you motivate the them? The pharmaceuticals are a special case because the FDA requires um, you know, vast disclosure of everything for years and years and years for the scientific testing so the bureaucrats can sort of go through the code and everything, but which, by which time, you know, your whole recipe is out there. And... Um, uh, it would never work for, pharma for pharmaceuticals for that reason. You would have to actually reform the, the FDA if you're going to get rid of the patent system in pharmaceuticals. But if we could actually have a pure market in, in pharmaceuticals without all this regulatory nonsense, then it could, it could work like a free market, you know, which is that you get a first mover advantage and, and then other people come along and emulate you. Uh, by the way, you know, it's a little funny. I, people always bring up the pharmaceutical case, but I'm always amused at my, my, uh, my own behavior. I go to CVS, I need to pick up some aspirin. And so you have like Bayer, and then you have like CVS brand. You know, and like Bayer is like $4, the CVS brand is like $2. And I'm looking at this thinking, well, but I really have a headache. 
Do I really want to trust this you know, sort of sketchy CVS brand? I mean, aspirin's been around for like 100 years, right? But I'm still like, no, I'm going to go for the bear. <laughs> so, you know, there you have a perfect copying. I mean, it's the same good, and I know this, but, you know, I'm an irrational guy. You know, I've got to have the bear thing. I, I think it's entirely psychological. I read up my medicine chest. I want to see bear. Oh, that cures me, you know? Something like that. And the, the market's a weird, a weird place. It can work with rampant piracy. It's not a problem. Go ahead. Um, just to bounce off of that, um, Night of the Living Dead has made a ton of money, but by accident, it was released without a copyright, so there's no actual intellectual property on that movie. Yeah. So he's saying that but Night of the Living Dead was released by accident, you know, um, without a copyright, which I didn't know. You know, it's funny, we look at Ayn Rand's books. Um, there was one that fell into the, into the commons. Do you know which one it was? Found has not in the commons. <laughs> Not Alice Rugged either. It's um, a uh, anthem, you know. And that book has its suffered either way for having been in the commons, you know. I mean, I, I really don't think that copyright matters nearly as much as people uh, tend to think that they do. One of the frustrating things I had happen to me at Mises was that there were many, many Austrian books that are out of print um, that I wanted to be able to put into ebook form and distribute, you know, universally, like Economics of Time and Ignorance by Rizzo and O'Driscoll. And Drizzle and O'Driscoll, you know, they wrote me and said, well, can you please publish this? And I said, well, sure, I'd love to, but I, I think we may have a copyright problem. And they said, no, no, we own the copyrights. And I said, yeah, you better check out the publisher about that. Well, they did own the copyrights, but they didn't own the distribution rights. They went back to the publisher, and the publisher was charging like $180, you know, or something. So they they'd like, they'd print a new one every time somebody ordered it, you know, and then um, <coughs> loot the consumer. How, how does this happen? How do you get monopoly prices? You get the monopoly prices through... Monopolies. That's how you get monopoly prices. So um, there's nothing I could do to bring the O'Driscoll uh, Driscoll Rizzo book back in print. Uh, it was very tragic. I mean, we're missing about 70 years of great literature because of copyright. It's really just terribly tragic. Um, when I was at, I got pretty edgy at Mises, starting to put out a lot of you know orphaned works or works that I sort of thought for a, like a brief moment might be orphaned. And I started really testing the system. Uh, it really got pretty out there after a while. I mean, back in the day, it wasn't a problem because the publisher was right to you and said, hey, take that down. Now, with the federal government and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, they'll take down your whole website, you know, which is why services like Mega exist. You know, the whole war on piracy hasn't stopped any shar sharing. I mean, you can, there's more file sharing than ever, which is another point to underscore what I was saying early, earlier. Government is surprisingly powerless. You know, we've got the Silk Road, we've got Mega Upload, we've got a whole world of piracy that's burgeoning and growing despite the war, you know? And this is, should give us a sense of hope. You know, the government's not nearly as fearsome and terrifying as, as they uh, like, like to make themselves out to be. Anyway, sorry, every question I keep answering too long. I'll try to keep it short next time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, um, we still need an answer to his original question, which is how does the author make his living? Oh, um, well, you, you remember how, do you remember how Brahms made his living? He was a teacher, right? Well, he sold, he sold first, but his main, his main living he, t he did through, for, as a teacher. I always annoyed him that his true love, Claire Schumann, you know, always made money as a performer, he never could. <laughs> anyway, inside joke. Um, so, um, but Beethoven made money by selling the first run of his symphonies. They lived in a world without copyright. The copyright didn't pertain at all in Germany up until the very late 19th century. And every composer from the, from the Middle Ages up to that point never had the benefit of copyright. And they all uh, borrowed from each other and all uh, flattered each other by stealing from each other, you know. And it, and it worked out for everybody. All you have to do is hold back your book and uh, sell it to the first one that comes along. Sometimes you have to give away your, your first one. You have to become valuable as, as an individual. And when I was at Mises, what I would do is I would just pay people a lot of money for the, for the rights to run it first. And they're welcome to ramp this up as high as possible. And I'm trying to get this system, same in system installed at laissez-faire books. You can also pay royalties. It's possible. Um, you know, by the way, piracy is not as easy as you might think. Um, there's a lot of books coming out, like every day. There are about 150,000 new websites coming online every day. It's really difficult to know what's valuable and to pirate. I really admire pirates for this reason. It takes real insight to know what a valuable book is and to reproduce it quick enough so that you get some benefit from it. Because by the time you know what's valuable, 
the guy has already made a ton of money and people are already involved in the network effect and, and buying from the existing publisher. So, you know, I mean, it's funny, the Hunger Games series, heavily protected under copyright, right? But if you go online right now, you can download it in HTML and PDF and EPUB and Mobi and, you know, everything else. Audiobooks. And audiobooks too, right? And there's an unenforceable, that doesn't prevent the company that published Hunger Games from making any money. I mean, smart publishers at some point forget the whole enforcement business. You know, who's this bastard? Eli Whitney, right? You know this guy? So he claimed to have invented the cotton gin, right? He didn't invent shit. I mean, the cotton gin had been, he existed hundreds of years. He just had a little flap to it. And he didn't, he, even, didn't, he didn't even do it. But he spent like 10 years cracking down on everybody else who had, you know, something that looked like a cotton gin, you know, during which time he didn't sell any cotton gins. And he went bankrupt. And he was super indebted. So after his cotton gin business, he decided to start making gun parts. And he encouraged people to pirate them. And he ended up making a lot of money in the end. So Eli, you know, so, you know copyright and intellectual property isn't as advantageous to entrepreneurs as they tend to think. I have a, so much to say about that. I'm just going to stop right now. OK. Yeah, right. OK, is that it? Thank you so much. Oh, one more thing before you clap. Uh, very sweet. Um, I brought a lot of Bitcoin with me. So anybody who wants some, I'm very happy to give it to you. Um, but what you have to do if you have a smartphone, <laughs> so fun! No, well, what you have to do is download the blockchain app if you have uh, an iPhone or an Android uh, phone. Uh, pick a 12-digit password that you do not forget because you cannot get it back. Um, and if you lose your, your Bitcoin, they just exist in the cloud forever. I lost 10 Bitcoins this way. Every day I look at them in the blockchain, I go, God damn it, those are my Bitcoin. I want them back, but I can't get them back. Um, so download the blockchain app. Uh, it's called blockchain.info. And um, pick a 12-digit password. When you get to that point, just come up to me. I'll scan your QR code and send you some Bitcoin, and you'll be an owner. OK? So anyway, thank you for so much for hanging around with me tonight. OK. Thanks for letting me.